What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gojo and Golick. Wow. How about that? Mike Golick Jr., Mike Golick Sr., and joined over on the desk by Jesse Cofield. Jesse, do you feel better than us, positioned above us right now? Absolutely. I definitely feel like I'm looking down on you guys, and I'm going to keep that sort of vibe as the show continues. As, yeah. as well you should. You mm-hmm. should be looking down on us. Yeah. And I really love how the fact that I've been at this the longest, yet you negotiated your name first. How did that happen? Yeah. Does he have a better agent than you? What's I, up? I, seriously. Really? The, the classic bait and switch of getting <laughs> over here and making it my podcast first, and then we just jam it on there at the end. So for everyone tuning in right now, maybe every podcast is somebody's first. Maybe you've been here for a while with the podcast or the show. So let's do the explainer here. Um, this is Gojo and Golik. We are going to be now live Monday through Friday, five days a week, 8 to 10 p.m. 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern yeah, yeah. on DraftKingsNetwork.com, Samsung TV Plus, and the DraftKings YouTube channel. You can check us out there. If you are coming over as a listener to the Gojo Show podcast, this is us now. This is who we are. This is not a separate thing. We are just more people now inside the family here on the DraftKings Network. And so that will still show up in your podcast feed for the podcast audience. Shout out, gang, gang. We appreciate you. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to be in all those same places, yes, same we are. social handles. So it's going to show up where it's always been for you. And if you're new and coming over because you saw us press about this, hey, welcome. Uh, we're in Boston this week. We're all yes, live we are. together. So how about that? We look and sound pretty good in the studio here. Uh, Jesse's still got the jacket that she stole from Kevin Hart. Uh, yeah. Weren't you supposed uh, to give here? that back? I'm definitely going to give it back. Definitely. No, you're not. I'm absolutely going to return this jacket that was worn by Kevin Hart. No, you're not. There we go. Yeah. Listen, eventually it's going to get uh, thrown back into the pile there. Or not. Who's yeah. to say? But So Jesse is going to be around with us yes. a lot more. Super producer Brandon Newman still very much in the building right now. One, He's minute, one minute before the show started, I said, Brandon, where are you going to be? And he said, I don't know. Yeah. We have no idea where Brandon is in the he building. He thought he here. might Zero. be in this room. Yeah, but he's not. <laughs> I, I think he might be at some point. Like, yeah. You want dynamic, he's a chameleon, yeah. and he's going to find his way in. So also, if you want dynamic, uh, you can follow the rest of the show. we got a great show for yeah, you we do. today. Yes, we do. Um, very much looking forward to a few things coming down the pipeline. As always, download, subscribe, rate, review, do all that good stuff. Leave us the five-star rating. Show the new show. Some love here. We have got a little snippet of our conversation with Hall of Famer Joe Montana Mm -hmm. coming off of everything we had go on this weekend in the world of college sports, which we'll get to. And, of course, his former team, the 49ers, trading Trey Lance to the Dallas Cowboys. We have also got former NFL GM Mike Mayock joining us here on the show as we break down cut day in the NFL coming up here. Very uh, solemn day for those of us that have lived it and been around it. Dad, you had a little better experience winding up on the other side of cut day than I did. I did. In the three teams I was on, I never got cut uh, during camp. I got cut like before the season started. Congratulations. I still got cut. Wait a minute. I still got cut twice out of of three teams. So, uh, yeah, I I felt the sting of that, but not in training camp where these guys are going to feel it. And we're we're certainly going to get into that. We got a lot. I mean, my gosh, baseball, basketball. Gojo got his name first. Two-time training camp cutty over here. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. I met the the Turks on multiple occasions. And and this is going to be a big one. This used to be you know, segmented. Now it's one big cut tomorrow, 90 to 53. It's going to be yeah, going to be made. But I'm not going to lie. I'm excited to be back on morning morning shows again. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And we sawed off the first two hours of what was normally a four hour marathon for you. For That's you're the welcome. Beauty. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. I know that was <laughs> yeah, your that was doing. my idea. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know it was normally six to ten. I get up at four fifteen. This is eight to ten. Yeah. You know, Eastern time. It's just a beautiful thing. I got some beauty sleep, so I feel like well, well, I don't look that. Good. Especially for you with the beauty sleep. How are you feeling? So I obviously raised hell last week because you and mom decided to ditch me and go over to Ireland yep. for the Notre Dame game in Dublin. You were yesterday in a different country and you're old. So how are you feeling right now? Are you okay? <laughs> I'm feeling a little bit. Yeah, we were happy that you dog sit it for Hank, Harry, and uh, Ted, our two pugs and bulldog. That was Aww. nice of you. While we had a ball, your mother and I had a great time over in Dublin watching Notre Dame victory that we're going to talk about. But yeah, I landed yesterday in Chicago with your mother and then stayed in Chicago for like three hours and jumped the plane here to Boston for these studios to be here for the week. So there's been some travel. Uh, I am 60 years old, so it does take its toll. I will be napping today at some point. Yeah, that is going to happen. Uh, You have earned the rest, as has that Notre Dame football team you're talking about, because uh, we had obviously a lot of newness going on in this Monday, but the most important fact is 
Notre Dame's still undefeated right now. Yes, they are. Coming off a 42-3 beatdown of Navy over the weekend. And obviously, love the Naval Academy. Going to be rooting for Coach right. Newberry and that team in the rest of the games that they play. That was fun as hell to watch. And I can only imagine what it was like seeing Sam Hartman sling four, count him four touchdowns in his debut performance in person. So it was, Woo! and that's what everybody was waiting for. Notre Dame hadn't had a, a passing quarterback in a while. So it was even as Sam Hartman threw a swing pass, people were like, we have a quarterback. It's like, wait a minute, you know, okay, it's a swing pass. Let him throw the ball downfield. It was, brief, a, it was a beauty of a swing pass. I know, though, it really right? was. But what you saw, I mean, he ended up going, what, 19-23, to 251, as Mike mentioned, four touchdowns, no interceptions. They ran the ball for 191 yards. They had nine different receivers catch the ball. And that's what I was most happy about, Mike, was get Sam acquainted with the receivers and the running backs coming out of the backfield. Yeah. Because th this turned out to be an easy win, which we all thought it, it would be and should have been. Yeah. But you wanted to start that relationship because, Sam, we're going to have to pass in some games to win. Yes. And that's been the fear in the past few years that if we had to pass our way back in, we were going to be in trouble. So they can do it now with Sam, a couple new offensive guards, finding the receivers that he's going to get a good relationship with. So it was a good start there, and I was very impressed with the defense. A lot of times, because that triple option is such a tough thing to run against because you can't practice at full speed during practice, that you usually give up some yards. But this defense clamped them down really, really well. I understand it's week zero. Yeah, yeah, it is. And it I is. understand this Navy team is probably going to be bad. Like they we, are. we right. mentioned, it's a new regime there. Coach Ken Niamatololo, who had been there for the longest time, with a ton of respect. There's a lot of turnover. And in a time in college sports right now, in college football, the triple option is probably in its dying day. I would agree. With the rule changes to cut blocking, college football, and all these different things, it's going to really be tough. And they were trying to kind of merge two worlds. So I get Navy is probably going to be bad this year. Notre Dame went out and checked the box in a big way. They did. That was as clean a win as you're going to see on both sides of the ball. And to your point, the biggest question mark has been in the last couple of years, that quarterback spot. Notre Dame's had a pretty well-rounded roster everywhere else. Right. They've had a high floor because of the offensive and defensive line of scrimmage. And so this definitely resets expectations, I think, a little bit. You're ultimately going to be defined by this year, Notre Dame, I think, your ability to win the games you're supposed to That's win. exactly right, yeah. yeah. Go out there and make sure you don't lose a bunch of these road ACC games, but we know everyone's got circled. Ohio State coming right. up in a few weeks. Clemson certainly right. on the road going to be a big one. And then USC at home with Caleb Williams and company, who we'll right. get to in a bit, certainly look potent, but this is all of a sudden a Notre Dame team who dad now seems to have the quarterback who's a literal adult in the room. He's a grown man. Yeah, He's 24 he years old. Yep. But also one capable of giving them a multifaceted offense that they haven't had in a while. Yeah, I mean, they, they, we have not been able to trust the offense to throw uh, Notre Dame back into games. Now you have that. You can throw them in or throw short passes or whatever to keep a lead. Uh, you have trust in that quarterback because some of the reads that he had, and that, that comes with experience, right? 110 touchdowns at Wake Forest. He's been a four-time captain now. He's a captain at Notre Dame. Uh, just his ability to read defenses and, and, and see a blitz that's coming and recognize it, put people in the right position was fantastic to see. And again, as Mike said, listen, we, we are Notre Dame guys, understand. They oh, were yeah, preseason 13. We're not saying move them up to number one. I mean, maybe number three, but not number one. So <laughs> Hey, listen, yeah. I, the world outside of the top six or seven teams is really close together. And so once you start to get into the other Pac-12 teams outside of USC to start the season and a certain other grouping of teams, Notre Dame was right in there anyway. And now you see this and go, okay, that looked the part. And to your point about the young receivers who you're trying to get to know, you know what makes life easier on everybody? Quarterback who knows what he's doing like that. Who would just, that was Neo in the Matrix. And we just haven't yeah. had that in a while. So that's why I sound like I'm in love right now because I am. Yeah, I'm in I, love I, with I, Sam oh, Hartman. Oh, your mother in the stands next to me. I'm like, Sam! Say, I mean, and, and his rib around his neck yeah, too. Yeah, and it's one thing with, Free, with a little creepy. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> one thing was I like I, it's an interesting storyline, but I had to read that headline a few times. Yeah, Sam Hartman with his uh, rib bone around his neck last year at Wake Forest. For anyone that didn't right, know, right. he missed the first game of the season. He was dealing with an issue that basically resulted in blood clotting because of pressure put on some blood vessels by a rib bone high in his rib cage. Had to have it taken out. His mom actually helped him preserve the bone, get all the bacteria off it, and then fashion into almost a shark tooth necklace that he now wears on his person going into the stadium. And Dad, if we know one thing about athletes, now that it worked, and he went out there and tossed four touchdowns in his Notre Dame debut, which ties 
uh, former Notre Dame quarterback and Wisconsin tra transfer Jack Cohn, right. and my former recruiting coordinator and Notre Dame great Ron right. Paulus right. as the highest touchdown output for a Notre Dame quarterback making their debut. He better wear that thing to every freaking game. Forever. I, 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 it's yeah. going to be like enshrined. They're going to put it in a little box and like keep it in the locker And I have no box. problem with that. Out. Like when I get my knee replaced in February, I'm keeping the old knee. I'm going to have mount it up on the... A knee is less cool than a rib. Though. I don't well, know. Not, you could get it mounted. Well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm not yeah. going to wear it around my neck. No. Obviously, that would look pretty, no. pretty horrible. It'd be huge. But, but I, I'm going to put it on the mantle. Yeah, absolutely. I haven't told the wife that yet, so we'll have to see get what happens. Get a little just, bronze plaque underneath yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, my left knee. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just want to be clear. You think mom is going to let you put a knee mm. on display no. in one of her homes? No, absolutely not. A place that she lives and decorates. Okay, so here's what you do. You mm. just put it there and you see how long it takes for her to notice. Oh, it'll be 10 seconds. Okay, 10 seconds, and that's the... Yeah, Mike, yeah. I moved that into the garage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or I threw I it away. I took one look at it. Or, that or, is true. Based on my mom's <laughs> history with things that are valuable to us, throw she might away. just throw it away throw like it away. she did my Pokemon cards, never forget. Yeah. So, yeah. That could yeah. be worth so, a pretty penny these days. I've oh. reminded her yeah. on multiple... She that was your retirement fund. She didn't seem to care. I was no. going to try to put my nephew through college yeah. off that. <laughs> no. <laughs> I will say, as, as much fun as it was in Dublin with the game, the Notre Dame game, and seeing them come out and play the way they did, if you have never seen Go See Them River Dance, we got to see River Dance. I have heard more I about mean, River Dance in the oh last two days. The they're, game? No, let's talk River Dance. Because they're, they're you had a bunch of events around this that yeah. you were a part of, too. I mean, there were 40,000 people yes. that came over here for this game, flooded the streets of Dublin, and you came away glowing about Riverdance. We had, and there was a Notre Dame event Friday night. I got to, I was fortunate enough to MC it. There were 9,000 people there. We did interviews and everything. But Riverdance was like kind of the main string throughout, along with some other, uh, other entertainment. They're unreal. I mean, they're absolutely, un I watched them and I thought my hip went out of place. I mean, it was ridiculous <laughs> how good knee, they are. Add a, add a hip to the knee. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and they did it on the field before the game. Uh, they had Irish dancers out there. It's very, very cool. The fly, it, it was, it was just a wonderful experience. Thank you for rubbing in, by the way, again all the things about the experience that you got to take in there in person. Mm -hmm. The flyover, the fire, river dance, all of that stuff. Like, did you at least get somebody me had to watch the dogs? I got you a T-shirt. Oh, let's see what we got here. Yeah, I got you a T-shirt. That is go. really nice. That's yours, Mike. There we go. I yeah. pre all right, there we go. My parents went all the way to Ireland and got me a twenty-six dollar T-shirt. That was actually a little more than that. And, and by the way, true, kinda... it was euros. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's pricier then. Yeah, that's exactly think. right. So yeah. I spend even more. The on conversion it. rate yeah. it all uh, gets yeah. up there. Mm -hmm. All right. So yeah. mm -hmm. we'll go. have plenty more on college football. Week yes. zero overreactions, which How about we are it? so oh. back, baby. It, we, one game and we already had the, the uh, uh, Kayla Williams winning a second Heisman. I, you know what? <laughs> he might not be the guy on SC that I'm predicting to win yeah. the Heisman anymore based on what we saw this weekend. Yep. But, uh, Dad, speaking of changes and reflections of right. market value from over the weekend here. Trey Lance was probably the biggest bit of NFL news over the weekend. We mentioned the <clears> final weekend of preseason games since there's only three, but the news preceding that was now former 49ers tra quarterback Trey Lance, the former number three overall pick in the draft, traded for a fourth round draft pick to the Dallas Cowboys. Were you as stunned as I was when I first saw that team name pop up as the new home for this quarterback? Well, you're not stunned with anything because it's Jerry Jones. That's the right. That's so. The I, the, the, the stunning thing to me was, and I'm going to get back to Sam Fran, was something I said before about that. And the stunning thing to me is when this move was made, everybody's starting to say, oh, what does this mean for Dak? This doesn't mean a damn thing for Dak. I mean, Trey Lance. Jerry Jones would like to I have mean, you believe differently. It, it, it's quarterback it, controversy. Yeah, <laughs> and, and he, he loves, loves that. that stuff. But I mean, seriously, for anybody to think, oh my God, they got Trey Lance. And I don't mean this bad against Trey Lance as I'm going to get into. But this is, means nothing on deck. Trey Lance goes there as a third quarterback behind Cooper Rush. The tough part for San Francisco is this year it's 8.3 dead money. Next year it's 5.4 dead money, you know, against the cap for a pick. And I said this before uh, on, our, on your show, is this is squarely in the sights of John Lynch, the GM, who has done a phenomenal job, right? Don't get me wrong. I mean, they, they, they have one of the best rosters, and he's made some great picks. But your pick of a high quarterback gets magnified because it's the most important position on the field. Three draft, three number ones, three number ones to move up to the third spot to get Trey Lance, a guy who had, you know, a little over two handfuls of starts. So to me, this isn't on Trey. 
they overestimated what Trey Lance was going to do. Now he got hurt too, so we're not really sure. It's a confluence of a lot of circumstances. And, and, and all of a sudden, Mr. Francisco. Irrelevant is seven, yeah, seventh round pick playing well. All of a sudden, mm-hmm. you know, it's an early Tom Brady taking over, and, and it's his team. Now, not to compare Brock Purdy and Tom Brady, but sixth rounder, seventh rounder, but still. A lot of people are going to look at trance, uh, Trey Lance and say he's, he's, a, he's a trance, trance. that he's, he's a bust. Well, at this point, he is, and that's just the business part of it. But I will look squarely at John Lynch and say this was a bad pick. This was a bad move. And a lot of times you don't want to admit it if you're a GM or a coach that you made a mistake and you give the guy every chance. But it just wasn't happening there, and I understand them putting him on the market. And I didn't know if anybody was going to take him or take a chance on him because, again, he's behind Cooper Rush there. Who's the backup to Dak Prescott? He's, he's third string there. So it sounds like there was interest from some other teams when it came to him. According to Diana Rossini over at The Athletic, the, Ra- uh, the Ravens, Bills, and Lions uh, also had interest in picking him up. But it sounds like the Dallas Cowboys coming up with that fourth round pick was well over what most other organizations were willing to part with. And if you are Dallas, outside of Jerry just wanting to make waves, this is a high upside, low risk move for them. Yeah. To oh, develop yeah, yeah, yeah. a quarterback prospect over the next couple of years, you've got the ability to control his fifth year option if you want to pick that up, which again is incredibly cost effective. We talk about that all the time with rookie first round quarterbacks. And now he gets the opportunity that Zach Wilson is also getting in New York. Right. Get a chance to sit and reset without the burden of those expectations, even though we know because it's Dallas and they've already got a complicated relate like dad. You saw the quotes from Dak Prescott, who was asked, were you given a heads up about this? And he said, no. Right. He said, I understand that this is the business, but I found out that morning. Obviously, everyone involved there between Mike McCarthy and Dak Prescott all seem much more worried about Will Greer, the former right. uh, Florida and West Virginia quarterback, who was the odd man out, who right. balled out yeah, in did. his final preseason performance. And they let him play the whole game so he could put that on tape. Dak was calling plays for him, and so they were all focused on him, but slid into that was, yeah, Dak wasn't given any sort of advanced heads up on this. And he said, I'm not surprised by anything that happens eight years into this league. But, Dad, do you think they owed him something for a guy that's already in kind of an interesting position with his salary? I don't think so because this isn't a threat to Dak. Even I know know it's the same position, but there is nobody in their right mind that says, oh, they got Trey Lance first time Dak starts messing up. They start chanting Trey, Trey, Trey. That's It's just not going to happen. It's, it's not, it, he's not a threat to Dak. Again, Cooper Rush, who has filled in last year when Dak missed five games, Cooper Rush went four and one. So he is a very capable backup that can help this team keep their head above water while Dak was out last year. So, no, I, I, I'm not one of those that said you owe this guy. This isn't basketball, which we'll get to, where those guys have a whole lot of power uh, in, in how they, they can receive information and what they can try and force. So I'm not really worried about that. I think one quick thing I do want to say, though, is let's look at the other side of it. Remember, we keep saying, oh, three first-rounders, three first-rounders for this. Let's look at the other side of it. The Miami Dolphins, who got those picks. Yeah. Look what they turned those picks into. Jalen Waddle got in the draft, and then they used those picks for trades to get Tyree Kill, Bradley Chubb, and drafted Channing Tindall as well. So... I mean, you want to talk about making the most of getting those assets. And that's why with Dallas, this conversation, I think, is going to become pretty simple. They still expressed a desire to extend Dak's contract. That $60 million cap hit sort of makes that a must if they're going to try and be financially viable next year. But I think looking back at the 49ers, there is going to be a conversation of, man, there's a lot of pressure because I think they've got what I call rollover blame right now. Because they're not getting dragged through the muck for making this right. pick after mortgaging their future to get to that third spot to take Trey Lance, the way it would be crushing other organizations because right. they've been in the NFC Championship game. Because they're a Super Bowl contender with yep. the rest of that You're roster. Right. If it dips and Brock Purdy comes back down to earth and Sam Darnold looks like the guy that we've seen there constantly, and now Trey Lance is somewhere else, and you're sitting there looking at the other bag that other teams have been able to pull off your mistakes in the first round, eventually they're going to come for you. And so that's the pressure that mounts on this 49ers team right now. They seem capable of it. We'll see. Nick Bosa, still not in camp, still holding out with that deal. Plenty to figure out in there. But, uh, Dan, coming up, he's not the only one that's still not where their team expects them to be. More interesting news on the Jonathan Taylor front. Mm. We'll see if one of the latest running back contracts tells us anything about what might happen with the Indianapolis Colts star going forward here.
All right, welcome back to Gojo and Golik. And speaking of trades or lack thereof, we have to talk about the Jonathan Taylor situation. Still has not been dealt from the Colts. Dolphins, one of a couple teams that are, you know, rumored to be interested in Taylor here, but apparently not willing to give up a first round pick for him. Not entirely surprising. That's allegedly what Indy is looking for. Um, if they're going to be willing to part with him. So DK Network's Nick Simon wrote up a piece about some other teams that are possibly interested in Taylor. So obviously the Dolphins that we've talked about. Then we got the Bucks, uh, Ravens, Bills. So guys, what do you think about this situation here? Because some people are saying like Indy isn't actually serious about trading him to begin with. Yeah, I think that's the, the first question I'd start with, Dad, is do we even believe the Colts are operating in good faith here? Because I don't. I would love to see Jonathan Taylor get out of that situation. It seemed to be made abundantly clear by Jim Ursay. There aren't a lot of good feelings between the organization, Taylor's representation, and certainly the player now. And I would like to see him get to a better spot, but I don't think the Colts are actually operating in good faith here. So, let me ask you this. Do they, well, they did say seek a trade. Okay, so I guess it would be kind of, go ahead and do that and we'll, we'll help you out. But secretly, secretly, well, do they want him by by saying, we want a first round pick, and if we don't get it, they can just go to Jonathan and Zayden and say, listen, and, and a team is allowed to ask for what they want. Remember, this is a business. And if a team wants to get rid of a player, or trade a player, it's fine by me if they want to get the most they can for that player. And if they want a first rounder and can't get it, maybe that's their way of saying, hey, Jonathan, we tried. What are you going to do now? Oh, I mean, yeah. They're, yeah. Setting, they're setting the market at what they know is an unrealistic yeah. place based off what we've seen. I agree. To say, oh, we're just asking. Like, no, you're asking for something you know is you're, unrealistic you're not gonna get. Right. to try and rub a player's nose in it like you have already. Like, Jim Irsay said the quiet part loud when he started tweeting he absolutely about did. how they yeah. feel about Jonathan Taylor, the player, his representation, the way they've positioned themselves in the running back market. <clears throat> That's why I don't think they're dealing on it. And now they it, have, like, plausible deniability, right? Because it's like the market is bad for running backs right. right now. And they're like, oh, well, we, this is what we asked for. So they're kind of like, But yeah. And I, I agree with that. Yeah. But to Mike's point, everybody sees through that, right? Yeah. Everybody sees through that and say, listen, you know you're not getting a first rounder for a running back nowadays. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. So while you acted like the good guy in this, hey, go ahead and look for a trade, you know, and, and we'll help you out. And they want a first rounder for it. I get it. I get, I get the bad faith move there. So will he get moved if he doesn't? You know, what's he going to do coming back out? He's due, what, a little over $5 million this year. Um, he's going to be running for somebody this year, I would imagine. I'm sure the Colts would still like it to be for them. It, they sh uh, that's the, been the most confounding part of all this is the Colts should be as incentivized as anybody yes. to try and keep this player happy. And they made this whole situation unnecessarily combative with a guy you're going to want running next to your rookie quarterback who's going to be incredibly RPO heavy in Shane Steichen's offense. And just in general, what better way to help onboard your super athlete quarterback who's trying to polish some area of his games than by offsetting his rushing ability with the ability of a guy who led the league in rushing two years ago. So what I don't know is what if there had been any offers made money-wise, right? Because I, I guess Jonathan, what, he's 24? 24, 24 years I old. I mean, this guy, we, we keep talking about running backs, you know, peaking early, like at 30. Well, he's six years away from that. So you got a while there. So I, don't, I guess I don't understand, even like with Saquon Barkley, Josh Jacobs, who signed that one-year deal as well, why you're not giving these guys deals, a two-, three-year deal that's worth 12 to 14 million a year. It's still unbelievably low yeah. from a salary cap standpoint. You got the top running back, Christian McCaffrey, averaging 16 mil, Alvin Kamara, 15 mil, then Derrick Henry, 12, 5. So if you offer these better running backs, Josh, Saquon, Jonathan Taylor, these three year, four year deals at that amount, it, it's actually low on the cap. So I, I, I'm sometimes not sure why they're not doing that. And that's what I had thought. Well, I think we see that copycat league thing come up all the time where all of a sudden you hear so much conversation and see so many people going, well, all right, running backs aren't worth this market right. setting price that we think we've been going to for a while. And so we're going to hard reset on that because we've seen injuries to some of those high profile guys, bad contracts given out that have turned out not in the way that teams had intended for all of them. And now we're getting to this point on the other side where you're seeing, and I don't know if these are instructive or not, but since that running back Zoom call that we talked about, and I saw Sam Monson over at PFF tweet about this, 
You had Austin Eckler get about $1.8 million more in incentives right. to stay in Los Angeles with the Chargers. You got Saquon get about nine hundred grand more in incentives. On, in incentives there to come back to New York. And then Josh Jacobs got about $1.9 million more coming up on that. And those were you know guys dealing with the franchise tag, guys dealing with that portion at the end of their rookie contracts. You've got Jonathan Taylor in the middle of this. I thought that Derrick Henry deal that you brought up which was, I think, a five-year or a four-year $50 million with like 22.5 guaranteed. It averaged 12.5 a year. I thought that would have been way more instructive. If you are coming up in the running back market, we all know running backs' most valuable years are on their rookie contracts. You're eligible for the extension after that third year. Why not lock those guys up at a rate that makes them feel good, that's a little bit over where you'd be at for the running back franchise yeah. tag, get the meat of their career. Like, again, this is the, unfortunately the part that still feels exploitative, but if you're operating from the team standpoint, that gets you a win. And if you're the player, you get three years of job security, probably heavily incentivize that towards the front end or put the guarantees towards the front end, and you get to that second contract that these guys are looking for. So, and you wonder when the running back position will come back. You have Bijan Robinson in Atlanta, Jr. Yeah. Gibbs in Detroit, the first rounders who went in the top 10. Can they change this? But Mike, the game might change this. We know it's a cyclical game, right? So the running back doesn't have the value right now. When, when and, or if and when will that value come back? You look at defenses right now, they're smaller and spread out wide because it's a passing league, right? You have edge rushers who are tweeners who, in my day, would have been too small for a DN and too big for a linebacker. Now they're the norm in the NFL, but it's all spread out. You have a linebacker out, another DB in playing. So will the running game become prevalent again saying, okay, you got small guys out here with spread out wide nines on your DNs. You know, you're kind of spread out. We're going to run the ball. You know, and, and make the running back, not, not do it to make the running back position big again, but this taking what the defense is giving us. I know I'm sure you're an old offensive lineman. If you had a spread out uh, defense, I'm sure you'd love to say, let's just run the damn ball. Let's go straight ahead. The, the issue is still going to be for them the availability of so many talented players laid into the draft, guys you can get young and cheap. Because there are so many guys at running back, because it's still the most accessible body type in football. It is. That you've got a glut of talent at that position, and that's what kind of undermines the value, is so many organizations can say, well, we'll just build a backfield like the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, they drafted uh, Clyde Edwards-Alaire at the end of the first round a couple years ago. That didn't stop them from having Isaiah Pacheco be the leading rusher on a Super Bowl that's team exactly last right. year. You're so right. that's what still undercuts that even if the game shifts back a little bit. I think the thing, it's almost going to be like the way NBA big men evolved, where you were wondering, all right, since the post-up was deemed uh, low uh, efficiency shot when we started going to a more analytically inclined model in basketball, and then now you see seven-footers who can dribble the ball up court. You see guys like Giannis. You see guys like Jokic leading the Nuggets to a championship. Running backs now, it's going to have to be guys full-time like McCaffrey's, where not only can you have tote to the be. rock in the backfield, but you can run the full route tree, and you're as yeah. good as a slot receiver, and you give them that optionality. Because, Dad, that to me is the biggest thing is, when you come on the field, a defense can't point to you right away and say, all right, that's the first two downs. They're handing it off to you. Exactly He's just right. a scat back. He's just a protection guy. You're going to have to unfortunately be able to do more. It raises the bar of what you've got to be able to bring. That's McCaffrey. That's Austin Eckler. That's Alvin Kamara. These guys where they can line up in the slot, line up wide, be a mismatch to the defense. Which And, and that sucks to say because you just said it. Austin Eckler. That guy had to fight I for know. his life fight to get him more money everything. out of that. And he caught a hundred, over 100 passes last yeah, year. Yeah, listen, I, I agree. It's getting difficult for the running back because you can get him in the later round. It's kind of a microcosm in San Fran where Trey Lance gets pushed aside because of the quarterback you got in the later round uh, in Brock Purdy. So it's still a tough position for him. Jonathan Taylor, few teams, Miami, Tampa Bay, Baltimore, the Bills going after a Miami, the hardest. What a, what a running back room that would be there. Yeah, I know Jesse brought up the article with a couple of teams mentioned Tampa Bay should be out of that right I, now. I that's agree. a team yes. that's going to have, I yep. think, more existential problems. Agreed. After this season here, you've obviously lost Tom Brady, the heart and soul of that offensive line. Ryan Jensen, yep. unfortunately, it's it sounds like may year. have played yeah. his last snaps there as they've had to overhaul that group. But those other teams, I thought it would be more contenders like the Bills, like the Baltimore Ravens and company, even like the Dallas Cowboys, who are in it to try and go right now with the roster you got, who might need one more thing right. to bring yeah. them over the hump. So from a team building standpoint, it's going to be interesting. We will talk to former GM Mike Mayock in a little bit and kind of ask him how he sees this going. Josh Jacobs was one of the picks in yes, his first was. draft class yeah. with the Las Vegas Raiders. So we could certainly check that out. But coming up next, 
Some is great, more is better. We need to get even more Notre Dame uh, in on the action and talk to NFL legend Joe Montana coming up here next. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Gojo and Golick. And of course, they are Notre Dame alums, and they just wanted to get some more Notre Dame into the show. Hell and yeah. Who can blame them? Okay. Woo! Yeah, yeah. Hear them out there just cheering for their alma mater. So, Golick Sr. was in Dublin over the weekend watching Notre Dame trounce Navy, as we heard about, as we talked about. He also um, had a chance to talk to another Notre Dame alum. You might know the guy, uh, Joe Montana. Pretty cool. Uh, Gojo also was on that interview. Amazing. We know Joe Montana's resume. Do I even have to talk about it? But he did win a national championship with Notre Dame, so he was there cheering on his boys like everybody else. So let's go ahead and take a look at that interview that these two conducted. All right, this is a fun one. Very excited to welcome in Super Bowl champion, national champion, and NFL Hall of Famer Joe Montana here on behalf of the folks at Guinness over in Dublin. So, Joe, you make the trip over to Dublin with the folks at Guinness to celebrate the start of college football with Notre Dame. What's this atmosphere been like? It's a combination of a lot of really great things all coming together. Oh, yeah, for sure. We have the whole family here, which has been great. And actually, um, our um, our youngest daughter, Elizabeth, and her husband had their new baby uh, baptized uh, two days ago here. So it's been, oh. been a lot of fun with all the family. Now it's starting to get kind of crazy because uh, all the fans are starting to show up. They, they've been slowly through, but as of today, yesterday, well, yesterday evening, we tried to walk around through the, uh, the little walking streets they have here and it was packed so but all because of this little thing right here <laughs> well <laughs> listen talk about that for a minute because the i've used four words since i've been here a few days a lot i'll have another guinness i've been that, that's kind of been my line so so what's going what's going on with them uh you know we, the 
we got some new things coming out. I've been with Guinness for a number of years now. And uh... All right, this is a fun one. Very excited to welcome in Super Bowl champion, national champion, and NFL Hall of Famer Joe Montana here on behalf of the folks. But uh, it's been a, been a great relationship here with Guinness for me and, and now with Joe coming on and, you know, Great people to work for, great tradition, sort of like Notre Dame, right? Big history, a lot of tradition here, and um, a great product, right? Yes, it and, is. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. And, we've been in, and the boys have been in charge of finding all the old older pubs and bench ones they want to see. So we've been trying to get around doing that. And now it's, things are getting crazy. And we're here at the... Um, uh, at the uh, storehouse, I can never remember storehouse. I keep wanting to call it a brewery. <laughs> it's, it's only 14 levels, so no big deal. Wow. I know. And, and in fact, they're, the, the kids and everybody are here taking, going around taking a tour. I'm sure the boys are all having a few pints along the way, but uh, uh, it's been great. It's been a great trip so far. So for you and your family, you get to enjoy all of those parts of the trips with the fine folks at Guinness, and that's a great time. The other part of the tradition you talked about in Notre Dame is over there trying to win a football game. Marcus Freeman heading into year two with the program. Joe, what's your expectation for Coach Freeman in year two as he tries to add to the legacy of this program? Well, I love what he's been able to do. Um, I think one of the things that... I that everyone I talk to about, I haven't been around him. I, you, he doesn't have my new phone number yet. So I used to call <laughs> after I talk, because I, I haven't gotten it out to everyone. I literally just changed it before I left for Europe about two weeks ago. And so normally I, I talk, talk to him a, a bunch of times and um, I'm sure he'll yell at me when I get down on the field for not giving him my phone number before the game. But um <laughs> Uh, I just think he brings a different understanding and a different level of professionalism to say that well, I don't think was there before. Um, and, and that person lasted a long time and you know, he won a bunch of games, but I, I think he's going to do great things there. I just, I just really like his demeanor. I like what he's about. I like what I see in that, what he's put on the field last year and was able to maintain where they were before and the only the only problem i see is man i looked at that schedule they what man they're stacked up there for a while so it'll be a great test and um but it's going to be a tough one for them the season that this has got some good teams coming up down the line but Joe, take everybody down on the field a little bit where they really can't go. Notre Dame gets a new quarterback, Sam Hartman, who comes over from Wake Forest, has thrown for, you know, I think 110 touchdowns. Everybody's excited because he can throw the ball and we feel we'll have a passing offense to go with the running offense. But tell us how difficult it can be to have a new guy come into a system, even though he's been around for a while, learn a whole new system, learn the language of the system, and then try and get on the same page with receivers and just what kind of a process that is. I think the, the biggest process, I don't, I don't think learning the system as much um, will, would be a problem. It's, it's getting that time with the receivers and, and, because that's the, that's the thing it takes the most for a quarterback is you get, you're looking at body language, you're looking at making sure they understand exactly what you're thinking. And it takes a while. Even, even when I went to Kansas City, I knew that offense. It just had different terminology, but Paul Hackett was there, who was with us with the 49ers and through um, our second Super Bowl. And so my transition was easy, but it was getting receivers on the same page that, that you're on. And just like simple little things, I, I called this one play and I told these guys, I go, okay, look, here's the deal. If you hear me say 20 read, I am not calling the ball to throw it to the halfback. I'm throwing it because they're playing the defense and I'm throwing the post. So as soon as you hear that, if you're running the post, you're the guy running the post, just get your head up because it's coming. <laughs> Even if I get a blitz, I'm hitting my back foot and I'm throwing it. And sure enough, I call it. He doesn't think about it, and he drops it. He didn't think it was coming, and he looks up, and it's there, and he drops it in the end zone. Oh. And he was so upset, and and they just said, "No, you just don't, don't. You can't get upset. 
because it's going to come again. We're going to do it again. I promise you. And it, those are the little things that have them understand what the offense is about and have the quarterback and the receiver. So I knew the offense more than they did. And vice versa. Now the, it happens with them. The receivers know it probably better than um, the quarterback now. And so he, he just has to spend a lot of Dad, you know all about the uh, Joe yeah. Montana late game heroics and ability to do some of those things outside of the structure of the normal offense, don't yeah, you? I, I did meet him at Notre Dame. He was there with my, my brother, Bob. They came in together, won a title in 77 uh, together, beating Texas in the Cotton Bowl when Earl Campbell was the Heisman Trophy winner. But then I got to, so I've known him then, and then I got to play against him in the pros so much. I go back to a game when I was at the Eagles in 1989. I can't believe they have stats on the internet you can find out for a game 1989, yeah. the year before I was born. Well, the year I was born, yeah. <laughs> well, you have to go on the line for this. On um, the line! Oh! On the line. Let's go! <laughs> you put it out there, and then yeah. you get it. Uh, on the interwebs. On, the on the interwebs. So 1989, sorry gang, you know, <laughs> dust off the stats oh, yeah. for this one. We were winning 18 to 10 going in the fourth quarter. <laughs> Joe didn't throw one, not two, not three. He threw four touchdown passes in the fourth quarter to BS 38-28. We sacked him eight times in that game, yet he still threw for 425 yards and five touchdowns and beat us in the fourth quarter. Good work if you can get it. So he pulled the Sam Hartman in one quarter <laughs> against NFL players Dressing. after getting his whole ass yeah. beat the entire game. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's why he's got a gold jacket and a bust in Canton that Boltman can also look at, and yeah. we're sitting here. Yeah, I, I, it's exactly right. Hey, Listen. he's going to have a knee up on the mantle, Ooh. okay? When mom throws that out, we should see if we can get them to put your knee in Canton. Yeah! Yeah, could we? Yeah. Should we so, start a campaign well, now? Put it, put it next to Reggie's bust in there, and that way it can be like when you were helping Reggie up after all those sacks, when he would get to the quarterback, you can have, I'm sure he was about knee level with this you. This is our that chance. Happened, so you just put your knee by Reggie's head, and there we go. It's yep. beautiful. I, am I allowed to flip both them off? Can yeah. I do that? Mm. Blur it. Do you I have a yeah. little blur button? <laughs> yeah. I actually don't think we're FCC monitored here, so I'm going to find the out for sure. The producers are saying no. Yeah. <laughs> just know in my mind, that's what I'm doing right okay. now. Okay? okay. That's what I'm doing. We, I have a visual. I have they're, a visual. They're definitely freaking out. Visuals are great. Audio might even be better. So why don't we get to some sound from the NFL weekend <laughs> that was uh, here with one special quarterback in New York.
My favorite part about being back in studio, because Dad and I have been doing the podcast for a little bit apart, is him readjusting to being a creature in a studio. Yeah. My dad has acted like he's a baby strapped into this chair. Yeah. Every time something happens, he's had people fetching his backpack. He just had his laptop fall off the desk over there and reached in and felt like the floor was lava and he had to keep himself attached to that. Jesse, you've got a baby at home right now yeah. operating in a high chair. It feels like we need to get him something like Very, that. Very, I mean, I, I'm feeling the same level of sort of like stress and anxiety when I, like when my baby makes a sudden move. And no. The mom don't do it. The instant yeah. like mom ultra instinct yes. kicks in and you go to reach and save it. Is this so. going to yeah. happen all the time? It might. I mean, I'm just 60. I'm He's not a like good boy. old, okay? He's a good boy. That's okay. We, we got some snacks. Aww. We got some snacks. Oh, stuff. really? Where? Yeah, actually outside the yeah, okay. We'll get Let's on get that. Get yeah. Yeah. I'm happy I got, your, I got your snacks right here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we want to uh, try out this Mic'd Up Monday, yeah. which we're very excited about. Some of the best NFL sound from over the weekend to get to. Uh, brought to you by our friends at Wrangler mm-hmm. right now. Made for the ride of life. You can save 15% off your first Wrangler.com order with promo code GOJO15. That's GOJO15. Mm-hmm. So shout out to Wrangler. Absolutely. Uh, like them, love them. Gotta have it. Also like this, the NFL felt officially back. Aaron Rodgers got on the field for his Jets debut against the Giants this weekend, and he and his head coach, Rob Sala, had this to say about his debut and performance. I had some butterflies for sure. I think that's that's always normal. First time I strap it on, it's, it's kind of the, the standard, whether I'm in year one uh, playing San Diego Chargers or year 19, you know, preseason number four. There's, there's always... Uh, some butterflies when you step out there for the first time, but uh, I loosened up pretty good when I got the ovation when I took the field. That was a special moment, um, uh, just to you know have that kind of support taking the field for that TV timeout. Uh, that was pretty special. Felt like that first drive was going to go score too. Uh, obviously, we got set back on that uh, uh, personal foul, but just just the way he works at the line of scrimmage, um, Garrett, a special football player. Obviously, he trusts him. And, um, you know, it's just a, it's a start. I got to say, do we think that if we got to the WrestleMania of head coaches, the last two standing would be Robert Sala and Dan Campbell? 100%. Yeah. 100%. They, they are. Two, right? it, Mike Vrabel is probably fear. He's got a right. lot of size. You go for Vrabel. That's a big dude. Boy, he hit the ball a ton. You know what? I maybe should put him in there. I feel bad now I didn't put him in there. They're just a little more jacked. Vrabel's got more functional mass. Yeah, but we do have D'Amico Ryans, too, another, another youngster man. as a head coach, so maybe him, too. The July NFL coaching cage match conversation <laughs> has gotten very interesting. As has this conversation, yeah. though, Dad, Aaron Rodgers, outside of dressing like a guy who talks about drugs publicly as much as he does, also went out there and played quarterback the way that we've become accustomed to in this game. But I think even bigger news for him, Makai Becton named the starter at right tackle. Right. Elijah Vera Tucker back out there in front of him. They had more of the full group in front of him in this game, and we got to see just enough of the good stuff with that touchdown. Well, to Garrett that's Wilson. been the thing. A couple of weeks ago, everybody was like, uh-oh, what kind of, what kind of protection is it going to have? Three of the starting old linemen were out. I mean, they were hurt. you got to wait till you get to the regular season. The fear would be is those injuries and do they keep sneaking up on you yeah. or they, they get you in week two where a guy's missing a couple of weeks. The greatest continuity you would love to have outside of the quarterback being there every game is those five guys up front. And when you start at about week 12, week 13, you can tell the teams that are struggling, they've had eight line combinations already or 10 line combinations already. So you're like, you know, you could be in trouble there. So we have to see if these guys stay healthy because they have everything else we were talking about. Brees Hall coming off the ACL, doesn't have to carry the whole load with Dalvin Cook. They have Garrett Wilson and brought in other wide receivers. And the defense is great. Yeah, the defensive line rolls two and three groups deep. I mean, Bryce Huff being out there playing in preseason feet feels like it's gaslighting me. That man going against backup offensive linemen is terrifying here. So all seems to be good right now in Jets land. We'll wait and see. Hopefully they don't have to get through 11 offensive line combinations again. But let's go for some more new here. Same quarterback, new coach, Sean Payton, the head coach of the Denver Broncos, talking after their 41 to nothing win to close out the preseason. It's always difficult this time of year. That hadn't changed really in 16 years for me. I typically meet with every player, and uh, I was on the other side of that four times. And pretty soon, my mom said, you need to start coaching or doing something else. The dream for so many of these guys is still alive, even if it's not here. The thing that keeps, I don't want to say us up at night, but making sure we find the right 53 and that you don't want to lose a player when, when you had control over it and then have him have success somewhere else. So to credit the players, you know, they a lot of guys will make this challenging with 
with their efforts tonight, during the week, really, and even last week. So um, it's always difficult. Yeah, the pressure of getting that 53 right, the pressure yeah. of cut down day, certainly something, but not nearly the pressure he has of making sure he gets the Russell Wilson thing right this year. That's the beginning of that. And he came in and set the tone early, talking about the other people that Russell Wilson had in the building on his on his team. Cough the Jets. Cough. Basically, he's saying, you know, they're, they're not going to be around. Then the whole Nathaniel Hackett talk as well. There's a lot of pressure on both those. Russell Wilson, everybody believes, is going to be a Hall of Famer. Had a horrible year. Sean Payton, he knew he has a Super Bowl win and his offenses are known to be high-flying offenses. Can they get on the same page? That's going to be the big question for them. And uh, and, and time will tell. 41 zip in the last preseason game means nothing. I... I can't see a world where they don't at least improve off five you and would think from so. last year. Yeah. Just because Sean Payton knows what he's doing here. Nathaniel Hackett was a first-timer. He was right. learning what he wanted, what right. he liked as a head coach. Sean Payton walked right in, and you mentioned, set that tone. He knows what he wants, how he wants it done, and he knows how to get there. Now, with this quarterback, there are different limitations and challenges. Probably going to look more like the 2021 Saints offense right. Right. than anything he had with Drew Brees, but... This is a guy that at least knows how to situate and operate as a head coach. In the, the biggest NFL. thing is Sean Payton likes to get the ball out of the hand of the quarterback. Russell Wilson loves to improvise. Well, so that's but, where the that's, marriage is. That's why to I say 2021 when you had Jameis Winston, when you had Taysom Hill in that offense, it was a lot more play action, move the pocket, right. the stuff I think we can get with Russ versus what we got with Drew Brees. But let's look at the real new new here and finish this off with our last soundbite from Bryce Young the rookie quarterback, the starter for the Carolina Panthers, talking about his preseason experience and what's gone on leading up to his first season. My teammates, um, you know, just, just giving me the confidence and pushing me really throughout practice, throughout, um, again, from rookie minicamp to this day, you know, we get after it and, and compete every day in practice. And, you know, that prepares you a lot. And then, you know, having these, these games uh, under my belt now, it's, it's great to be able to, you know, take that and then translate to playing against others. And again, obviously, I haven't played in a regular season game before, and it's going to present challenges that, you know, I haven't faced yet. But I'm excited for that. And, you know, I understand the challenge that comes with it. And, um, you know, I'm excited to grow through that. And I'm going to be able to, you know, it's great to know that it's not just me out there. Again, I'm going to be able to lean on my, my teammates, my brothers for that, my, the coaching staff. Um, and, you know, that, that's where that confidence comes from. So, Dad, we now have all three first-round right. rookie quarterbacks <laughs> named as the starter. C.J. Stroud, the latest after their final preseason game against the Saints. What do you expect from these guys going into year one? Uh, not much. I mean, they're rookie quarterbacks. I mean, it's just, and, and I don't mean that in a mean way, but you're a rookie quarterback. You're on bad teams. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to turn the ball over. The defense is not going to be able to carry you at all times. So there's going to be a struggle. But I have never had a problem with teams like these, in this case, Carolina and Houston and Indy, who I don't think are going to be on the competitive side this year, though you never know. But I don't think that is to put these rookies in, let them get their eyes watered and their nose bloodied, let them learn. Uh, so I, I am fine with all those guys starting. That's why it, it's so interesting to me that, again, Jonathan Taylor is 24 years old. Yeah. You have a rookie quarterback, so a, a rookie quarterback who you took in the first round, so that's a five-year deal, including the team option. You have time there. And again, the long contract won't cost you that much as a running back. Why you wouldn't want Jonathan Taylor in the backfield with a rookie quarterback who can run as well, I have no idea why they haven't been able to work that out. That O-line needs to come back. They had a bad year last year. But you're setting up a 24-year-old in Taylor and a rookie in Anthony, Anthony Richardson to be your backfield for years to come. And, again, it won't cost you a ton. I don't get it. And you've got a quarterback on a rookie contract, which we've yes. heard is supposed to be this overwhelming yes. advantage for you in financial planning like that. The cool part for me as, as someone, listen, I cover majority college football, especially for my job outside of here, and so you get to see a lot of these guys. These look like the exact same guys that we handed off the baton from, from college, right? Do, they do, Anthony yes. Richardson, game needs a little bit of polish in certain areas, but moves in the pocket and operates right. there better than people would expect. Otherworldly athlete. C.J. Stroud got the arm to make all the throws. You saw that on display last night. Bryce Young, true like NFL-level accuracy, functional accuracy, where he's getting to the ball. For all these guys, it's in Carolina. Is the protection going to hold up? Because that right. got scary in the preseason. And do they have guys to get open? Because I think especially for what we saw in uh, Indianapolis and what we saw for Bryce Young in Carolina, I got worries about their receivers right. being able to get loose and get after it. We're just getting started here. Coming up next, we'll get Mike Mayock in here to help us work through cut day in the NFL and find out how you go about planning for these rosters.
Welcome back to the inaugural episode of Gojo and Golik. We are live from our Boston studios. I'm Jesse Cofield, joined by, as you can see, the Golics. Just want to remind you, this show is going to air from 8 to 10 a.m. Monday through Friday, 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Okay, you can watch us on Samsung TV+. Plus. You can watch us on DraftKingsNetwork.com. You can watch us on the DraftKings YouTube page. A lot of options. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Gojo, to Golik, who are going to have a very special guest joining us. Yeah, no, this, I mean, honestly, this is a guy we've known for such a long, long time. time. Yeah, yeah, Going back to my days at Notre Dame, where he was one of the voices of Notre Dame football that yes, you heard he there. Yep. Obviously, background in the NFL as a player and as a GM recently. Mike Mayock joining us now here. Mike, how you doing? It's great to see you after a long while. <laughs> it's a thrill to be on with the Golics. And, and just for the occasion, I wore my BC hat. Oh, see, Let's you've got go! very excited. So Jesse Cofield is in studio with us. Proud Boston College lacrosse alumni here. So you've got some company. You've actually even the score here now, Mike. Let's go. I love it. Jesse, we're two, we're two on two now. We got a shot. All right. And, I like our know, odds. I got I to gotta talk to dad for a second. I got to tell dad a story about his son. Okay. Oh, oh, boy. Okay. So I get the Notre Dame gig, and I'm going in, and usually when you interview – college players for the first time they're a little bit shy reticent maybe give you one sentence two sentence answers and we brought in this Mike Golick dude and he sits down and he starts interviewing us <laughs> and for like 15 minutes he's asking us questions he's done his homework he knows who each of us are he's asking questions about our background and when I finally got a chance to ask him a question about Stanford or wh whoever the heck we were playing, they were playing that week, he went on for 10 to 15 minutes on every blocking assignment, what the linebacker did, what he was going to do. And I just started laughing. And I was like, when he left the room, we were all like, well, if this guy can't make it in the NFL, because he's a little bit undersized and maybe not as athletic, if he's not going to make it in the NFL – He's got a hell of a career in television, radio, podcast, whatever. My, young Mike put on a show that day. It was pretty cool. I think he was just sucking up to you so you would talk nice about him on the, on the broadcast. Yeah, I, probably, need, I needed yeah. Mike to show, throw me a little bone yeah. here because some of those blocks I talked through, I was going to inevitably miss, which is why I ended up going <laughs> undrafted and why that ended up going the way it was. But it was so much fun to get to sit with you guys then, Mike, and, and certainly fun to get to visit with you now and, and hopefully get some insight as to what this couple of days is like in particular. We're coming up in the NFL oh. on the cut down days here. This is something that you've lived from a variety of angles, but most recently as a GM, as someone in charge of making a lot of these decisions. So what is this period like coming off the end of preseason football as you get ready to trim this roster down to the final 53? Yeah, it's a crazy few days just because your pro staff with the help of your college staff has spent this whole preseason watching tape of all 32 teams, compiling all kinds of lists about basically if a guy gets cut, who would you make a claim on? Who could upgrade? And if, if for instance, if you know on your roster, you're light at offensive line, interior offensive lineman, and you know another roster might be heavy, at, at that point, you're, you're kind of hoping that one of those guys might come loose. So you spend this whole big block of time and ultimately, you're hoping two or three players might be waived that you can jump on. The flip side of that is that you've got to cut a big number of guys, and you're hoping to protect most of them for your 16-man practice squad. You don't want to lose those guys. So there's this balancing act of if one or two or three guys come out in the league – We've got to already have pre-clearance with the coaches that if this guy comes, we got another guy we got to let go. And you better know who that is up front, okay? So you're not just cutting the 53. You're cutting beyond 53 in your head internally in the office because you might make a claim on one, two, three guys. And then again, you're trying to get the agents and even the players when you cut them, you're sitting down with these guys and say, listen, we love you. You need some more time. You're in our system. We don't want you to go anywhere. We're going to release you today. If you pass through waivers, don't leave town because you're going to be back on our practice squad tomorrow. So there's an awful lot of prop work. 
you try to do your homework on all sides and you try to make the right decisions along with your coaching staff to get to what I would call the final 69, the 53 plus the 16 man practice squad. So, and, and while it's, it's sped up this year, the cuts used to be over a couple of weeks. Now everything is going to be tomorrow from 90 to 53 from the roster standpoint. So going in, Mike, to that last preseason game, even before the yeah. game for the back part of the roster, how much is already set? And for that last preseason game, how many players are actually playing for a spot? Yeah, and Mike, it's a really good question because it brings up a couple different things. Like, I don't think a lot of people understand that the reason, the main reason they went to 90 this year with no other cuts until the final cut was because teams were having trouble having enough players available to play in the final preseason game because you're going to protect, a lot. I'm talking about prior years, right? You're going to protect a certain number of veterans. You've got a certain number of injuries. And if you only have 75 guys, it was becoming really difficult to get through that final game. So they enlarged it to 90. I mean, a few years ago with the Raiders, I had a problem at center. I probably should have called young Michael, but we, <laughs> called, we, we had a problem. We couldn't even line up at center, and we had a game in uh, Winnipeg, Canada against Green Bay. I think it was the second week of the preseason. I, I forget. It might have been the third, but we needed a center, and I signed him on a Tuesday or Wednesday. He played that weekend. He played every snap of the game. He wow. played 60 or 70 snaps. And it was just because we needed a body. And we were honest with the kid. You know, what he wanted out of the transaction was to put plays on tape for the rest of the league. So it, it, it's to answer your specific question, Mike, when you get down to this part of the roster, it you have a really good idea of the top pick a number, 60, 62 players, somewhere in there. Um, you have a good idea who you want on the practice squad. You're trying to figure who you can cut that might get through waivers to your practice squad versus if you expose a guy, might he get picked up? And so there's, I would say there's four or five key roster decisions in there because you're not sure how the league's going to respond to who you ultimately release. But the last game is critical. I saw uh, some comments the other day about how Austin Eckler made the made the job made the team uh, in the last preseason game. I think in 19 frick, 19 what was it 81? I made the Giants because I played well in the last preseason game, and so I always think there's value. The more reps you can see a young player play, not only for your own team, but for the rest of the league, the better chance that kid's going to have to stick either on your roster or on somebody's practice squad. Mike, you mentioned the importance of a lot of those reps for guys trying to make the team. Then there's the other side you mentioned of the veterans and in some cases dealing with the holdouts. Josh Jacobs, a guy who you know very well from your time with the Vegas Raiders, just re-signed now for a one-year deal. He had been doing the back and forth there, battling the franchise tag like a lot of the rest of the running backs in the NFL right now. How surprised have you been, Mike, with the way the running back market is seemingly bottomed out here in this last year? I think if you take emotion out of it, which I struggle with because I drafted Josh and I love the kid and I feel badly for Jonathan Taylor and for Saquon Barkley. You know, they're at the top of their profession at their position, yet they're paid way below other positions. So I, I empathize as a former player with that. However, in our free agency system, when you look at supply and demand, let, let's face it, number one, it's a pass first league. So who's getting paid? Quarterbacks are getting overpaid. Tackles are getting paid. Wideouts are getting paid. On the defensive side of the ball, anybody that can rush the quarterback, interior or exterior, is getting paid, and corners get paid, right? So we don't talk about safeties or linebackers or fullbacks or guards. You know, they, they aren't getting paid either. But at the end of the day, the reason the running back market, on top of all that, is depressed is because supply – exceeds demand. When you look at the running backs around college football and how many of them are out there that can help you, all you got to do is go back to last year and Isaiah Pacheco in the seventh round with Kansas City. So at the end of the day, I think there's a confluence of a bunch of different reasons, but that's what happens in, in this particular um, 
situation that we have as far as the salary cap in the NFL and the running back position lags behind. So one more on this before we get to some of the other storylines. So, you know, we know the running backs, the top running backs had a phone call and had their gripe session and which came out of that, as Nick Chubb said, we can't do anything about it. So, you know, what, what, what are we going to do? Fun phone call to say hi to everybody. So we all know the situation. Everybody gives their two cents on what can change it. What do you think changes the valuation of the running back in the future, or is it destined to not be the value go up anymore? I think as long as we're a pass-first league with, a, with, with an abundance of running backs coming out of college every year that can play at a high level and a position where you can, rather than have one back play the whole 60 or 70 snaps, you can have a running back by committee, and you got plenty of backs that can do it, and you got backs that – you know, Michael Carter from the Jets, who they got in the beginning of the fourth round. I mean, he is a tremendous change of pace guy. Third down, pass game. As long as you can divide the labor and there's enough labor out there, I, I don't think the system will change. So, Mike, putting yourself, you know, back in the GM hat on here, obviously you mentioned you've got the familiarity with Josh, but we've got the situation with Jonathan Taylor, too, who's still earlier on. He's not dealing with the franchise tag, but clearly – upset with his standing there. You've got a player that's that important to your team and a young quarterback in Anthony Richardson who you're also trying to take care of. How would you go about the Jonathan Taylor situation if you were the Indianapolis Colts? Well, I'm also a big believer that you've got to reward your hometown guys, the guys you drafted and have played at a high level for you and are team leaders in your locker room. Um, and everybody defines culture differently and every new GM and every new head coach gets up at their first press conference and they talk about bringing in a new culture. And it's easier said than done. So if Jonathan Taylor is a guy that has played at a high level, I think they drafted him in the second round. He, he's had a couple of career years. Last year was down a little bit. But if he's truly one of your leaders and one of your top locker room guys, my opinion is – and, and it, as a former GM, I cringe a little bit because every dollar counts with a hard salary cap. You got to you got to make every dollar spread out to be a better football team. Yet you've got this conflicting emotion of a guy that's done everything for you. He's done everything right. He's a high level player. I would think you could find a way to pay this guy. And and to me, that would if if I was there, that'd be important. And and to be honest with you, um, I, I think they might have been able to get somewhere if they didn't get public with their owner and the owner's comments. I think that's a whole different component that gets thrown in there that makes now it's public and now it's harder to make a deal. 100% agree. Yeah. Then that's the one I don't understand the most. You could have a young Jonathan Taylor and a young Anthony Richardson there for a while. That would be something. And speaking of Anthony Richardson, Mike and I were talking about rookie quarterbacks starting. He's starting. C.J. Stroud, Bryce Young, all starting for their teams. What has been your thought process over the years on starting rookie quarterbacks and how you perceive them that their, that team season? Yeah, if you're drafting a rookie quarterback high, as long as he can protect himself and the team can protect him, I think you want to play him as soon as he's ready to go. Okay, so some quarterbacks might be ready to go week one, day one. Let's go. I've got the mental. I know that I know pass protections. I know the checks. I've got an answer. And you might get beat up a little bit, like Peyton Manning goes 3-13, and 13, but the next year they completely turn it around and every rep he got was valuable. The flip side, you can go back to maybe David Carr, who was probably the most beat-up quarterback in the history of the league as a first-round pick. And I don't think he ever had a chance. And I don't know how much of it was on him and how much of it was the O-line, And but he got sacked more than anybody. So my the bottom line, guys, for me, is if you're taking a guy that high, as soon as you feel like you can protect him, he understands enough of the offense. And a guy like Anthony Richards is intriguing to me because he only started 13 games. Um, I don't know what his mental capacity is or isn't. You know, those other two guys you mentioned, C.J. Stroud and um, Bryce they were Young. Bryce Young, thank you. There's a lot of tape on both those guys. You can see their physical and their mental capabilities. Richardson, you don't know. I was at the Eagles Colts joint practice uh, last week, so I got a chance to see him up close. You want to talk about a physical speed? He looks like Dante Culpepper to me, being an old man. Um, he's a little sporadic, 
accuracy wise, even in a joint, like this wasn't even a real game. He's all over the place a little bit, but there's an awful lot of talent there. And I give them credit for saying, we're going to start you. Let's throw them in. You're not going to probably, you're not going to win 12 games anyway. Let's get him in there with the offensive line. Let's get him in there with his wideouts and let's do it. Here's the important point. If you're Chris Ballard, You've started seven seven different quarterbacks in the last seven years on opening day. Now you've got an answer. Whether he's good or bad, we'll figure out down the road. But now you got an answer that you can build around. And I think that brings clarity to the whole franchise. You mentioned the pressure, especially when you take a guy that high. I want to look at the Trey Lance situation. We had the former number three overall pick in the draft. Very similar in terms of experience coming out to Anthony Richardson, albeit at an even lower level at FCS football, but now traded for a fourth round pick to the Dallas Cowboys. How much blame does the 49ers front office deserve for how that situation panned out, even though they've built such a quality roster around that position? I think at the end of the day, and again, another really good question. I think at the end of the day, it's like Bill Parcells used to say, you are what your record says you are. And all the BS that surrounds everything else, I understand. So here's the thought process. If, if Look, San Francisco's got one of the best rosters in the league. I mean, Shanahan and Lynch have done a great job. So they trade all this draft capital. They go get Trey Lance. His numbers are what they are. You've got him up there right now. And Trey Lance has underperformed, and he's been hurt. Let's give the kids some, some, uh, a little bit of balance here. The kid's been hurt. Uh, and then all of a sudden, this seventh-round kid comes out of nowhere, Mr. Irrelevant, and becomes very relevant, right? So on the one hand, you can crucify this front office for taking him at number three and giving up all that draft capital, or you could give them credit for drafting Brock Purdy and having all that talent around them. And guys, I've lived it. I've lived this exact situation with the Raiders. We took Clee Farrell at number four overall. Okay, and Clee has not had the career we anticipated. Yet in the fourth round, we took Max Crosby. And Max Crosby probably became what we hoped Clee would. So at the end of the day, the Raiders are getting the production out of Max Crosby that they were hoping to get out of Clee. And I would make probably the same argument that if Brock Purdy continues to play at a high level, who cares? We gave up the drop. The, I shouldn't say who cares. We all care, and there, there's accountability. Right. But what I'm saying is if you continue to win and build a great roster, that's what's more important. All right, Mike. Well, we really appreciate uh, you coming on the show as, as we get this thing going, me and my son. It's all, always great to talk to you. And don't worry about wearing the BC hat. We blurred out the BC yeah. on the hat so no, <laughs> nobody can see it. <laughs> hey, guys, good luck with the show. It's always awesome to hook up with you guys. Thanks, Mike. Thanks appreciate so much, it. Mike. Really appreciate it there. <laughs> I, I, when he talked about those production meetings back in school, yeah. and you were, oh, yeah. you know, we've both been on the other side of these yep. now, calling college games, yep. calling NFL games. I remember as a player, it was so funny the big prize used to always be back then if you know Notre Dame NBC that long standing affiliation you'd get the NBC sports hat yes and you would see the guys that go to the production meeting you would go in there you'd sit and talk with him and Tarico and that whole crew and then you'd get the hat you'd see guys walking around the locker room I wore that thing into the ground. I mean, and you were working for ESPN at yes, that point yeah. Mike, Mike, it was all that stuff but I'm over here wearing the other opposing team's colors just like Man, listen, they gave me a free hat. I finally, at that point late in my career, got asked to be a part of the production meeting I, yeah. and go hang out with those guys. I Feels was cool. Huh? Yeah, when you, when you get asked to be in one of those meetings, you like feel pretty cool about it. Sounds like you did well in there. Did you see him get in there, though? A little undersized, maybe not that great. Yeah, I didn't appreciate yeah. that. Go I was like, how about that? I was that? gasping over here. Yeah. He, was like, he actually said, he said a little undersized, not the most athletic. Yeah. I was like, okay. Well, yeah, he's like, already wow. dead. Yeah, I, just, like, I like to overcompensate for being small by also being slow. Well, mm. that's See, the yes. real key there. Yeah, nice. I, I've used that one. I, 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 my career, I was slow and I made up for it by being weak. So, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> no, apparently you passed those genes on down to me. Yeah, and sorry I just about that. Whittled away at them even he more. He just kind of snuck that one in there. Yeah, it was, there. again, yeah. I, lo I love Mike. You know, we got to see him around yeah. there for years, all those things. But yeah, that was a little <clears> bit of a subtle yeah. shot. And, and subtle. we'll talk about it some tomorrow. It is cut day. It, it's a tough day. And a lot of people, I understand don't care much because it's the back end, end of the roster, but it's a lot of players' dreams, man. I was going for it. You were going for it. I mean, it's it, it's a tough day, and you just 
you, you just pray that that door doesn't knock, get knocked on or that phone doesn't ring and, uh, and you make it through that day. It's a, it's a tough day tomorrow for some players. It's a tough day and you hope to at least make it to that day uh, and not get cut somewhere weird like an elevator holding a Subway sandwich, which is a story I can tell you guys tomorrow. <laughs> Coming up next though, let's get to a high profile athlete who decided to become a philosopher in his spare time, apparently. Uh, back after this, it's Gojo and Golan. So, uh, in addition to all the football we had this weekend, week zero preseason, we're just, it all feels so right. I am one bit of fall bite in the air oh. away from full, you know, the first feeling. So nice. I caught a whiff of it. I was in San Francisco two weekends ago, and it's just cold and rainy there all the time because yeah. the Pacific Northwest is never not on brand. Shout right. out to the Mariners, by the way, who might be the hottest thing up there. But I was up there, and I caught a little breeze, and I was in, like, the ultimate, like, fat white guy outfit of shorts but a hoodie up top. Right. And then I felt that little breeze, and my eyes legitimately started to well up because I realized what, a great what that thing. meant. What a it's great fall. It is fall, and it is pumpkin spice season. Yeah. Woo! Who doesn't love that? People have already gone to Starbucks to get their PSL. We walked in there this morning, and they yep. had the little pumpkin lanterns out on there. I, I love it. I would like to fight Starbucks, though, because we have Christmas cups. Why don't we have Halloween cups? So true. I agree I with mean, that. I mean, come yeah. on. Everybody can agree on Halloween cups. Yes. Right. And, and I agree. I don't want to hear a word about, oh, the spice shouldn't be out yet. I mean, no. It can be out all year long. As, as far, far as, as I'm concerned, concerned. yeah. Exactly. Like, right. I understand the you. pumpkin connotes Halloween, like you mentioned, but... Fall spice, that's all just autumn, baby. Yeah. This yeah. is season. This is yeah. a vibe. It's yeah. the bite in the air. It's not any one holiday, so let freedom ring in the PSL front as far yeah. as we haven't even gotten to Halloween concerned. candy yet, which by God we will. It's oh, on God. sale right now yeah. in grocery stores. Yeah. If you're looking to get lucky, you can get I real gotta load foggy. up. This is my first year having owning a home. Oh and, like gonna have trick-or-treaters and oh, stuff. Oh yeah. See, I'm Jesse, ready. very important to set the standard right away. Mm -hmm. You wanna be the king size house. King size candy bar house. It's gotta be. Mm -hmm. If there is one gotta thing be. you guys passed along to me yep. from generation to generation, when I owned a house in Connecticut. Everyone on the block knew what I was about. Everybody. Your house will never get egged and never get TP'd. Yeah. As long as you're giving out the, the, the big size. I'm 100% I'm already on that train. 
So while we've got all of that going on in fall, we got a little while before we get to NBA season. But right now, we got the FIBA World Cup yes, going we on do. in basketball here. Team USA currently up on Greece right now. I am loving this round of NBA action because Anthony Edwards has seemed to take center stage yes, on Team has. USA. And the best thing for all of us in the world of professional basketball is if Anthony Edwards continues the star, the star turn. Because uh-huh. that guy is an electric content factory. <laughs> And an incredible athlete. Yeah. So we love that, first and foremost. Yeah, we love that. But we also love what the international <laughs> stage provides us as far as sound bites, because we've also got some international competition going on in track and field right now. And Noah Lyles, who is one of the best track athletes <laughs> the United States right. has on the men's side, got up there and was talking at the podium about the concept of a world championship and felt like sending a stray shot towards the world of NBA basketball. Listen to this. World champion of what? The United States? You know, the thing that hurts me the most is that I have to watch the NBA Finals and they have world champion on their head. World champion of what? The United States? Don't get me wrong. I, I love the U.S. at times. <laughs> but that ain't the world. That is not the world. We are the world. We have almost every country out here fighting, thriving, putting on their flag to show that they are represented. There ain't no flags in the NBA. (laughs) Wow. My brother in Christ. Wow. First off, to drop this on us while we're currently fighting a war with French Twitter over cuisine supremacy. We don't need this right now. But second off, Dad, did he just ignore all of the international flavor in the NBA and the fact that it is the best league in the world where all the best players from the other countries in the world come in order to play? Uh, can we introduce him to Nikola Jokic, Giannis Antetokounmpo, <coughs> any number of star players that call a different land home? There are, there are two sports where we call world champions, correct, of our, of our yeah. four majors. Uh, that's the NFL and the NBA. And... I don't think anybody's arguing the NFL is the world because, you know, American football, as I was just in Ireland, was Gaelic football, rugby, soccer, how many different footballs there are uh, as far as popularity. Uh, But are we to believe that whatever NBA champion is that year couldn't beat any team around the country, any FIBA team that's playing right now? And like any team from any other league, like yeah. that's the whole point. There's a lot of very good basketball around the world. Hence why we're living in an NBA right now that is largely dominated by players that were born yes, outside is. the U.S. Joel Embiid from Cameroon, Nikola Jokic, who we talked about, Giannis. I, I mean, a whole host of others. And look at this Hall of Fame class from this last year in right. the NBA. We said outside of Dwayne Wade, it was a Hall of Fame class defined by international flavor. That's not up for debate. But the fact that the NBA is the best league in the world is also not up for debate. And so, thus, I would love to barnstorm whoever the NBA champion is and have them just go and serve a reminder one time. It's kind of like when we sent the Dream Team. Yeah. You know, it said, said, wait a minute, they're kind of questioning, well, let's send the Dream Team, shut everybody up. Okay? Do we have to do that? But it's our own guy. Their own guy saying this. It's friendly fire. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. You need to see it. Didn't see it coming. He also delivered that line like he'd been practicing in front of the mirror for hours. Expert level delivery. (laughs) Incredible. We'd love to get him on the show, by the way. We need to reach out to his people. It sounded like the Allen Iverson. It was talking about practice. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, wow, the inflection. Yeah. (laughs) Not the only one who sent a message, though, uh, to his team or any team, Jesse, as we saw in the NBA this last week. So, you know, obviously, like we've been talking about, FIBA underway. Um, U.S. actually playing right now. They are up on Greece. And someone who's not playing for Greece is Giannis. His brother is in action, but he is not playing. And he actually was talking about that. And they were asking about his contract with the Bucks. He's up for, you know, a contract extension in 2024. And he basically (laughs) said... Next summer, it would make sense for both parties. Even then, I don't know. I would not be the best version of myself if I don't know that everybody's on the same page. Everybody's going for a championship. Everybody's going to sacrifice time away from their family like I do. And if I don't feel that, I'm not signing. Okay. Deep. It was deep. I I, love this. Uh, okay, so you're all about this this quote. Uh, fair enough. He's basically saying if we're not going to be contenders and everybody's not going to sacrifice the way I am, then why am I going to resign with you guys? Which is a very general idea. Yeah. But to me, it's more about what Giannis's goal in all this is. Because we look at Giannis and we've always seen really genial guy. Yeah. At first when he came over, it was documenting him trying all these things in the U.S. Smoothies. 50 Nuggets. Yeah. He's a really great personality. He tells the dad jokes. Yeah. 
this guy is about his business. Mm -hmm. And he's been on record of saying he wants to be like Dirk and Kobe. He wants to be a guy that plays his entire career for one organization. But he also wants to win. And Dad, you remember before Giannis signed this most recent contract, it was a lot of the same tone and tenor out of him publicly because he wants to keep pressure on this organization to keep making moves that he thinks are aimed towards a championship because he knows how he's going to be defined ultimately, and that's by rings plus minus. Without question, it's the sport where the player has the most power, correct? And I know people hate that now when the players are the ones creating super teams and not the teams creating super teams. Everybody seemed fine with that, but when the players are doing it, all of a sudden is they have too much power. Well, they have power. That you, we keep talking about NFL flush with money. The NBA is so flush with money. When you see free agent contracts going out there, it may, we, we always say NFL guys avert your eyes uh, because you think you're getting big deals. Look at the NBA guys. So they have the power. Giannis has the power to say, basically, if you want me to stay, you better build something around me or I'm out. Because we know players, if they complain enough, and depends on how much you complain, like James Harden, maybe you could find four you're complaining. But if you want out, you can get out. So it, th this is the players have the power. And as I have always said about athletes, really anybody in business, if you ever get the leverage hammer, swing it as hard as you possibly can. Uh, can. Giannis has that because he's one of the best players in the league and he's on a team that needs to, he wants to stay competitive by keeping the players around them or bringing in others that will help win a championship. So he's, he's got the microphone, he's got the gavel, he's got it all, use it, man. And if you don't like it, then you make a move. And, and I think with Giannis, he kind of can have his cake and eat it too on this front because he's not a guy that we've seen make the moves as extreme right, as you right. talk about with Harden or going back to Kevin Durant and all these things that really shift the balance of power. But he is saying, hey, if you guys actually want me to stay and do this, and remember there were quotes before, uh, I forget if it was last year or years ago, him talking about, oh, how cool it would be to play in Chicago right, potentially, right. what a great town. He's always kind of kept that floated out there just to say, don't mistake my kindness for weakness. I want to make sure, if I, he said, if I'm going to stay here for another 10 years, and this was an extensive New York Times article talking with Giannis about that, if I stay for another 10 years but don't win another championship, he knows how everyone's going to talk That's about exactly him. Right. And he's a competitor. He knows how he feels about that situation. That guy wants to be not just one of the best individuals ever, and he's got the individual hardware to do that, but he wants to continue to climb those ranks of all-time greats. As I've said, I can't stand that, that rings for a quarterback, Super Bowl rings is a thing because there's offense, defense, special team. Basketball, I see it, rings to your name because you can be on the court the entire game and have a say on offense and on defense. So for basketball players, I understand that more, and he's just looking out for it. You know what? And, and I know fans in Wisconsin, I feel badly for you after the whole Aaron Rodgers thing that you just went through. This might be a little bit triggering right now, but that's the price of doing business, baby. Showbiz.
So while technically this should pain me talking publicly about USC, uh, <laughs> given the affiliation, Coming off week zero in college football, Dad, it was exciting to have the sport back. We know it wasn't back for everybody, but Notre Dame kicked off the season in right. Dublin. They were the first game, but we had plenty of other ones out there, San Diego State and Ohio. You had plenty of interesting teams, but USC was the other one a lot of people had circled. Top 16 in the AC, uh, AP preseason poll with Caleb Williams, the reigning Heisman Trophy winner. They go out, got a solid win against San Jose State, 56-28. They end up pulling away late after it was a little close early. And there's certainly a lot we can talk about in this. Caleb Williams already coming out of the gate with a Heisman Trophy-worthy right, play, fumbling right. a snap before throwing the longest touchdown pass of his career in the same breath. The USC defense, plenty of improved bodies, but still a little bit uh, questionable decision-making at times. The story coming off this weekend, Zachariah Branch, yep. the freshman wide out for USC, the number one wide receiver prospect in the country, one of the top players, I think seventh overall according to 24-7, in this last recruiting class as both a receiver and a return man. Four receptions for 58 yards and a touchdown, one rush for 12 yards, and a 96-yard kickoff return for a touchdown. Dad, this is the first time I've watched a receiver. They've had other quality guys there since this name. That gave me Reggie Bush vibes, yep. watching the way that he moved in the open field, returning that touchdown. And I thought, my God, Caleb Williams' best competition for the Heisman coming off. You were talking about the ultimate week zero reaction. Might be a guy in his own offensive room in Zachariah Branch. That dude was electric. Came out of the gate strong. They got another freshman. What is it? Uh, Deuce Robinson, who was a freshman yeah. tight end, like 6'6", 225, 230. I mean, they have some athletes there. Uh, for Caleb Williams trying to be the, the only you know, back-to-back -back Heisman Trophy winner since Archie Griffin back yeah. in the 70s from Ohio State. Uh, so they and, and they preseason number six and they get the big win here even after a, a bit of a slow start But that's what is always interesting to me is NFL It's rookies that come in and, and NCAA the freshmen that come in and the impact that they can have on a game and you go wow Okay, the first thing you say about them is okay. You got three years and that's it. Yeah. Yeah, and he's a smaller guy yeah, he is. We know, he is. Yeah. but Incredible speed. I think you saw he touched 20, like 26 miles an hour on one of those treadmills over the summer. And, Dad, you talk about especially at receiver. That's one trend we're seeing in the NFL. Almost all the top receivers <laughs> taken have made immediate impacts and looked really good in the preseason. And in college, because we know going all the way down, football's trickle-up economy when it comes to the scheme changes and the advancement in the sports. It's high school coaches making what they can out of their resources. And with all the seven-on-seven -seven reps and how much spread offenses have been long-standing in high school now, these receivers are coming up each level more and more ready to go than they've ever been. And when you can impact as a return man the way he has, and you've got that natural ability, that change of speed that we saw on display, these guys are harder and harder to keep off the field early. And that really is, like you said, the whole story of USC's offense around K. And it happened a, a while, a little while ago, a few years ago, because we've seen, you know, rookie wide receivers come in and have an impact. But there was a time where they didn't. It was the running backs yeah. that had the impact as rookies. And that's what you looked at. And it wasn't the receivers now because, you know, we just had Mike Mayock on, and it's, it's not like it's a big secret out there. It's a passing league. So now these wide receivers, and again, it's not just the first rounders. that you find one in that third round or the fourth round that's going to break through. And you mentioned this kid. He's not big, 5'10", about 175, but he's a freshman. So he'll get, he'll, you know, he'll get, he'll get painted in the weight room, you know, yep. add some of that muscle and such. But it, it is amazing to watch these wide receivers, how quickly – they assimilate to the NFL. Good bloodlines for him, too. His brother Zion's a safety on this team, but his great uncle, Cliff, the Hall of Famer for the uh, Las Vegas Raiders, also just recently in the Hall of Fame there, someone that you can certainly point back to and say, all right, he's got greatness in him, uh, certainly going all the way up to that level. That guy's a nightmare. The number one thing you worry about as a defensive coordinator, and I'd imagine a defensive player, is how do you defend speed? Right. Who's yes. the guy that could hurt you in that area? And now everybody who's playing USC, including our Notre Dame Fighting Irish, gets to turn on the tape and go, all right, we got to stop one first and foremost, and then the Heisman Trophy winner in the backfield. It used to be the tight end was an instant bailout for a, and it still is to a point, a quarterback, yeah. right? A bailout. But now a bailout is that speedy receiver who, if you're getting pressure, when in doubt, you throw up a 50-50 ball thinking, you know, it's going to be 70-30 in your favor if you've got a speed demon. Yeah, it, it, it's unbelievable. So I thought he was outside of, you know, Sam Hartman going to be one of the big stories of opening weekend. Right. But Zachariah Branch had that coming out party. Everybody is going to be ready and waiting for him. And if it's based like uh, anything we saw this weekend with that speed, there ain't going to be a whole lot most people can do about that. Um, 
Let's get to something else that we saw in the world of college football from over the weekend in a more negative sense, Jesse. A punishment handed down technically with the NCAA in mind, but a self-imposed bull ban for ASU heading into the 2023 season. Yeah, so they informed the NCAA and Pac-12 it's going that ASU is going to self-impose a bowl ban for the 2023 season due to alleged violations of NCAA rules that occurred, you know, under ex-Sun Devils coach Herm Edwards. So ASU still under investigation by the NCAA and we're being told that players were, you know, made aware of this ban and that it was just mayhem in the locker room. Everybody was really upset and disappointed by this decision. Uh, Golick Sr., I know that you were just re rearing to get to this topic because you really can't believe it. Well, I, I, I can't believe the timing of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you get a program and right before the season starts where I, I don't think there's a high expectation for this. In all honesty, I, I'm mad at the timing of it. This is a school trying to get ahead of what the punishment that might be for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they say, we'll self-impose this ban. You know, but they're and, still under investigation like, and, and they are and it's, and it's usually to try and soften it. the blows. Right. So yeah. the NCAA exactly. We'll go a little bit lighter. We saw Michigan. That's why they self-imposed the ban the three game suspension right. on Jim Harbaugh for that. It's reason. amazing. This is where we are. The NCAA. This is where you swing your hammer when Jim Harbaugh buys a hamburger for a recruit or, you know, there's some Ill illegal visits or whatever. What was going on? a little more involved at ASU. Yeah, Antonio are, Pierce, the former yeah. D coordinator was supposedly the ringleader of you know, they were having recruits in when they shouldn't, working them out on fields when yeah. they shouldn't be. Inappropriate contact yeah. during the COVID-19 yeah. recruiting periods the with players period, that ultimately yeah. ended with a number of people from that staff losing their jobs. Yeah, but the, the bottom line here is they're, they're kind of, you know, what I've always hated about it is you're punishing players who weren't around for it. Yeah. Right? And, and a new head coach. And, yeah, and, well, yeah. And that is something the NCAA had been trying to distance themselves. Like in the last couple of years, the NCAA going back to last year had changed that policy where teams like Memphis, who had been in trouble on the basketball side, Tennessee on the football side, had paid a fine instead of having to punish players and take away from their opportunities. Because you're right, Dad, the timing of this is despicable. Right. And Ray Anderson, who's the athletic director at Arizona State, is still the same guy who hired Herm Edwards. He's been the holdover for this. And last I checked, there is nothing negative happening to Ray Anderson or the university. It's instead these players and coaches who, uh, Kenny Dillingham's taken over. He's the youngest head coach in yeah. college football. And he's got to stand before that team. And he was talking after practice saying, I found out that morning too, I had to deliver this message to these players who now have no ability to get out. If you're a senior where that bowl game carrot was something you really cared about, you no longer have the option or opportunity to potentially go and find another home to play. It's not like they were consulted on this right. decision, whether to pay a fine, which maybe you can say you're the school having a conversation. Do we think we're going to make a bowl game in year one? Can we eat this right now instead of having to eat into our athletic budget and pay this kind of fine? The players and coaches weren't consulted in that. The people affected well. by this, it's not like the NFL where it's bargained. It's a joke that the adults in the room between the NCAA dragging their feet on this investigation and then Arizona State choosing to bring this down as a surprise the Tuesday of week one, every adult involved in this should be ashamed. And themselves. ASU added 51 new players this cycle between transfers and yeah. incoming freshmen. And, and, and I saw on, on Twitter where a lot of people are saying, well, these players are just going to go. Well, to Mike's point, they yeah. can't. Yeah. They can't go now. It's too late in the process to go now and there were 20 seniors who the only goal they had was a bowl game we mentioned or mike mentioned tennessee went through this and they paid an eight million dollar fine now asu doesn't make the money tennessee does so maybe they don't want to pay and who's to know what number the fine would have exactly been tennessee's would have been. violations were a little and, more in excess and, and in all honesty i mean okay here here's where the truth kind of comes into play and and i'm always on the player's side and i understand that the players got blindsided by this as well, the coaching staff, ASU's not making a bowl game anyway. They, they, they were not going to have enough wins to make a bowl game anyway. They might not, but that wasn't for the adults I to agree, decide I agree, in the manner, I agree. the manner in which they did it and the professional nature or lack thereof about yeah. how this whole operation between, again, I won't totally let the NCAA skate off this yeah. because they've been investigating this since 2021. Right. This isn't new. All the other people have jobs already that yeah. were a part of that. Right. Every one of those names that we mentioned. So the way that this was handled top to bottom, just an absolute embarrassment and unfortunate for that great team.
All right, if you've been here, you know. If you haven't been, you will. This, that, and the third. We'd like to finish off with three quick stories before we send you off on your way into the rest of your day. As always, make sure you download, subscribe, rate, review. Show some love to Gojo and Golik. We fit the old man's name in the title so he'd stop crying and texting my mom outside Unbelievable. How long? I've been doing this a little bit longer than you have, and my name is second. That's why I just figured you'd be fine. Like, all right, like I've had my moment in the sun. Mike, it's your turn. Moment in the sun. Get it? Whatever. I was going to complain, but you're you're lucky your mother, she said, leave him alone. He needs this. Oh, mommy stepped in. Yeah. Okay. I have no problem with that. I can step in and kick your ass, too. Yeah. Whoa! Whoa! I'll, Whoa! I'll pull, that, I'll pull that knee out myself and put it in the You're going to beat an old man who's not had tw- yet, not yet. 12 surgeries and you're going to act like a big man by taking me out? Yep, I am not above hitting an old wow. man in public. Wow. That being said, uh, yeah. let's get to this, that, and the third, uh, and away from violence, which we don't legally condone on this show. No. Um, and get violent. to this, that, and the third. And start off with this pretty harrowing story oh out gosh. of the world of NASCAR. Thankfully, with some good news, NASCAR driver Ryan Priest, whose car rolled over about a dozen times in a crash at Daytona International Speedway over the weekend, is out out of the hospital on the way home and appears to be recovered from dead. What was just a grisly scene. I mean, we're used to, in that sport, plenty of crashes, plenty of that as a part of the spectacle. But this one, you saw with the severity of it, everyone immediately understand that this was different and Thankfully, the result is what it is now with the driver who's going to walk out of this fine. So, uh, again, this is a sport where nobody knows more than the drivers of what can possibly happen to you. We've had tragic events, obviously, where drivers have lost their lives. But as you mentioned, even in something like this, not only does the fan, but i got to believe the drivers, other drivers or, or crews, hold your breath saying, how, you know, how is somebody surviving that? You know, but the technology protects them so much better nowadays. And to know, what, 12 hours later, I believe he was going home. Uh, and, and, I mean, just just, just the fact that sur- he actually got out of the car himself yeah. before they put him on a gurney. But you watch that crash, and you, you just you fear that the worst has happened. You just pray that the worst didn't happen. He, he originally, tweeted two hours after this. He, he, uh, unreal. he went and tweeted, if you want to be a race car driver, you better be tough. I'm coming back. What a savage. Two hours after that crash. And like Built you said, different. 12 hours later, he's being discharged from the hospital. Yeah. I feel Built I'm different. tough, but I'm not I'm not NASCAR driver tough. Yeah. Nope. No, 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 no. Any of those problems. Nope. So happy to hear the yes. good news has prevailed there and excited to see him in his own words yeah, back absolutely. out on the track here sometime very soon. Jesse, let's get to that, though. <laughs> very sad story in a yeah. celebration of a life that impacted a lot of us at our most critical moments. Yeah, Bob Barker, longtime host of The Price is Right, passed away on Saturday at the ripe age of 99. A mm. lot of people going on the internet and being like, he got as close to 100 without I going agree. over. I agree. Bailey so Carlin, good. my dog. A so good. just like honoring his legacy in that way. So Saturday, Adam Sandler also uh, tweeted, paid tribute to him. You know, obviously, he made a hilarious cameo in Happy Gilmore where he played himself. So Adam Sandler, the man, the myth, the best, such a sweet, funny guy to hang out with. Loved talking to him, loved laughing with him. Loved him kicking the crap out of me. He will be missed (laughs) by everyone I know. Heartbreaking day. Love to Bob always and his family. Thanks for all you gave us. Now, I I have to say, guys, and I know this is going to... I've never seen an episode. Of oh, come on. What? I know. Were you never sick as a kid? Just I stop was it. sick as a kid, but I don't, I watched like prob- the shows I'm not supposed to watch. I watched like Maury, like Jerry Springer. Like, oh, yeah, like you watch it. Are you the too. father shows? I, I, yeah. And I'm you, certain I had to turn that off the minute my mom, you know, came anywhere near downstairs. I never, never saw an I told episode. you that wasn't my baby. I you know, never yeah. watched The Price is I've Right. I've never seen an episode I, of The Price is Right. Come on. It's I, sick. I, know. I am just disgusted. I mean, I know. I know. Sick? Like, that was, Bob Barker was my shepherd through childhood illness. When you were home from school and you either, because you tricked your parents into thinking you were sick. My favorite. Or actually were sick and got to sit around there Watching The Price is Right and sitting there with bated breath trying to figure out, as a 10-year-old, how much does a sea cost? <laughs> what is Five Nights in Cabo actually run here? What do, I mean, what's the current going price of breath mints? I don't know. Yeah. I wasn't buying that stuff yeah. at a gas station. I couldn't drive. And Bob Barker helped me through all those moments. And this is no slander to Drew Carey, who's done a great job yeah. in his yeah. stead since mm-hmm. Bob retired. But when I close my eyes and I think of game show host, and that gets brought up, 
Bob Barker will forever be the image in my head. Dad, he is, whether it is your GOAT conversation, what is your Mount Rushmore conversation, in my lifetime, Bob Barker is the greatest game show host that has ever lived, and in my mind will ever live, because I think we're past the golden age of game shows. Yeah, we are, and certainly he would be on, you know, the greatest thing in TV and radio is the Mount Rushmore of anything. Bob Barker is there. Right, I mean, I might give him two spots. I mean, Bob Barker is there. Look too. what he did for the pet population. I mean, listen, what an animal lover he was. So, I mean, I fall in love with that right there. And, and as you mentioned, kicked the crap out of Adam Sandler. And yeah. he lived to 99. Who's not signing up for that? You sign up right now to yeah. get to 99. Oh. Wow. The tiny stick mic, all of the yeah. just I he, he was perfect in every way yeah. when it came to shepherding us through that. Guiding people up to the wheel of all ages, yeah. sizes, yeah. abilities to make sure they spun that and didn't get crushed by it. And, and nobody will ever be the, a game show host for 150 years like he was. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so rest in peace yes. to the great Bob yes. Barker. I'll, I'll Thank catch you. an episode. Yeah. I, you, you, I don't, you know what? You know it's what? Sick. It's this sick. This show has about four more minutes. I'm done yeah. with you. Okay, 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 minutes, okay. Fair okay. enough. One, you know, one I day feel in, that. Yep. And wow. you've already come in and, and just wow. slandered one of the most important things. Holy I know, smoke. I know. Next thing we're going to come into March, like, guys, you know what? Donuts actually kind of out. Oh. I know you're a donut fan. I would never say that to your face. I like donuts. Okay. I'll bring in some donuts. I don't even know there what to go. believe anymore I'll about bring one in of some our donuts. Bring in some donuts. To make this right. Somebody better bring in some donuts. Yeah. Speaking of our co workers here, a lot of yes. people have asked as the show has changed shape and form. Super producer Brandon Newman is still very much in, around, and a part of all this. He's just been a little busy as this weekend, as we get to the third, we want to highlight our man Brandon Newman going back home to PRP High School in Louisville, Kentucky, where he was induct inducted into their Hall of Fame for his great work as a football player on campus all those years ago. <laughs> wow. Look at Pleasure this guy. Park High School. Brandon, getting in front, firing up the youth of the nation. That wow. is awesome. Look at that inducted into his high school Hall of Fame. That, that oh is fantastic. God. Good for him. Because God knows every time we talk to him about football, he's talking about what great plays he made. Isn't man, he? Well, I mean, it was so funny. He was getting ready for this, and he went back and was looking. He had to look at some stuff for his bio, and he pulled up like his junior year of high school stats, and he called me one day getting ready for the show, and he goes, I kind of forgot. I was him. <laughs> I was year. Had like him. eight and a half sacks from the <laughs> nose tackle spot. Ooh. And I can attest to the, the player that Brandon Newman was because we had that high school, the Army All-American Army game, All game that players would have coming out of high school. We had like 13 guys from our class at Notre Dame played in that game. And Brandon and I were both on the East squad together. I was an undersized 275-pound center As playing Mike high Mayock school. said. Yeah, yeah not super athletic. Maybe not the most athletic. Yeah, you know, all those things showed up against Brandon, who's a human hammer, 6'1", and was like 320 pounds, and promptly truck me in one-on-ones that week and made a reputation. But the thing I will never forget about Brandon playing against him as a football player is also, I'm sure, I'm sure he talked about in his speech, was his mother, Selena Newman, who oh was an absolute gosh. saint, yeah. but who in the Notre Dame spring game our freshman year, me and so Brandon. So for those that don't, yeah. and just catching this, Mike and Brandon were teammates at Notre Dame. Yes. As well as playing in the All-American game uh, with one another. Yeah, so I went on to play mm -hmm. at Notre Dame in our first spring game together. I line up at guard, Brandon lines up at D-tackle across from me. I give up a sack to Brandon. Unsurprising. It took to my senior year to play. I was a late bloomer. Is it because you were undersized and a little less athletic? Yeah. All those things snuck Probably. into play. Okay. Yeah. And Brandon gets the sack, and it's the spring game at Notre Dame. There's yeah. 30,000, 40,000 right, people right, there. Right. And all I hear crystal clear is, that's my baby! Yes! <laughs> Brandon Norman! Brandon's mom a could be love. heard yes. by everyone. And I looked at Brandon and I go, Brandon, tell your mom you're welcome after yeah. the game for that one. So <laughs> congratulations to Brandon Newman. Super pumped for him. Dad, as someone who's in your high school's Hall of Fame, pretty cool moment to get to go back to the old stomping grounds. Like a that. As I have said, listen, uh, I love college ball. I love the NFL. But there is nothing like high school sports and especially high school football where you don't have that responsibility yet. It's not big business like when you get to Division I college football and then certainly in the NFL. It is like that last bastion of just playing ball and hanging out with your, your teammates as classmates as well in high school. So to go back and be honored there, just a very cool thing for Brandon. I'm very happy for him. Yep. I drove past the Friday Night Lights at a spot near my place the other night and got a little misty eye because yeah. you do remember what it can mean to so many people and clearly what Brandon meant yeah. and that impact yeah, that he had cool. on his high school. So very cool. congratulations yes. to Brandon Newman again, who in addition to being one of the funniest and best looking dudes around, 
Well. Also pretty good at football. Speaking of responsibilities, you have one to go download, subscribe, rate, and review this podcast and show. Give us a five-star rating. Check us out on DraftKings YouTube, Samsung TV Plus, and DraftKingsNetwork.com. And join us again tomorrow. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you then.